Book your driving lesson now at dla-driving.co.uk. Welcome to Oh When The Town is the Christmas special. I'm Lou Gregory, joined tonight by Dave, Bataro and Stephen. Merry Christmas, boys. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas mate. How are we all? Yeah, it's I love brilliant it. to be here. Excited for the big day tomorrow? Yep. Yep. Can't wait, actually. Can't, it's going to be good this year. Can't wait for all those lovely yeah. presents I'm going to get. Bataro, you don't seem too excited about tomorrow. No? It's Christmas, isn't it? No, it just doesn't do it for you, does it? No. Well, maybe today will. This podcast we've got lined up is a pretty special one. I'm so excited. I feel like this is the biggest one we've ever done. Three players on, three former players. Uh, well, Monker is a current player. But Tom Craddock's on to play our game, the Advent Calendar. Diving into the past, some of his best moments of his career. Uh, the Wembley game, Brighton game, the slap, everything. He touches on that. Leon Barnett discusses some of his all-time players he's played with and against. He's picked an 11 for us. And George Monker is on to talk about some of his favourite things. Really exciting. Brilliant. Can't wait to see it. Should we get straight into it then? Yeah, let's do it. Come, boys, come. Start with Tom Craddock and the Advent Calendar on Owen the Town. Tom Craddock, welcome to Owen the Town. I think we should start by getting you to pick a number between 1 and 24 for Advent Calendar. 24. Richard Money was in charge when you were at Luton, wasn't he? Yeah. What was Richard Money like? Because I know he wasn't like he wasn't that loved by Luton fans. What was he actually like as a manager? I had a bit of a love hate relationship with Richard. So when he when he came in, um, he didn't fancy me because I, he wanted to bring um, he wanted to bring Barnsley and Matthew Barnes Homer, and so we were we were similar sort of players. So and I knew for a fact he didn't fancy me because he didn't play me, and you just you, the way someone communicates with you, you, you can tell. Um, but he, he was actually he was really good on the training ground. I really enjoyed his sessions. Like his sessions and, and his tactical stuff was really good. Um, and I just thought, well, I want to get my head down and prove him wrong. Um, and obviously, I did that, and he ended up playing me a lot. And it, it was just on the training pitch, he was really good. But the other part of it, I the argument with the fans, I think it was at Tamworth, yeah. and some of the other bits, he was a little bit. Um, too concerned with like things on the outside, if that makes sense. Such as I think there was a few with a BBC fans forum or something, and he he got us all in Portugal because he thought there was a leak in the camp. He was, I think, he was a bit paranoid for want of a, want of a better word. But um, training ground really really good, knowledge really really good. Um, but I just think the other the other side of it, I think that that let him down a little bit, and I think he felt he probably felt the pressure as well, and that's maybe where. Well, let him down. And and I think he had a, he had an ego. And after the first after his first full season, his first season, sorry, when we got beat by York, rather than keeping the team the same, he wanted to change it, put his own mark on it. And obviously, it didn't work because he lost his job. If he'd have kept it and kept the same squad and kept the same starting team, I'm almost certain we would have went up. And then I think we would have bounced straight through League Two as well. That first season in the conference, you got 24 goals that season, and. If it wasn't for, I think it was Stevenage who were just went on a mad run. I think we were on like 98 points. But it's like you said, it's, it's, it's that kind of season. And if that's followed by something similar, like you said, that, that could end in something like promotion. It just it just wasn't meant to be in the end. Yeah. And as I said, I think you just try to change things and things that just didn't need to be changed. We had a real good dressing room. Um, everyone, everyone got on well. We had good experience heads. We had young lads like myself and we had a few even young lads. We had a good middle group. Um, and I think sort of after the end of the season we had, if you'd have kept the same team, because I think we won 20 out of 22 games or something, no one would have had any complaints. And obviously, if you lose form, you're out the team and what have you, but there was no need to change it. And and I I mean, for instance, I got told I wasn't first choice anymore. And I'd sort of thought, well, I got my head down. I was top scorer. Why shouldn't I be first choice? And a bit of ego on my part as well, but I just thought, yeah, 
I just thought too much. He was trying to change too much, and it was unneeded. I remember the season after the one we missed out on in second place. I think you had like five games. You you played a couple and you scored away at Fleetwood because I remember Luton fans going like, "Why is Tom Craddock not starting? Like he's the best striker. Why is he not starting?" And then I think that's when you you got your move away. But it's a shame, really, that Luton fans wanted you to play. Luton fans saw your quality from the season before and and when you first joined. That it was just a shame then that it, it was kind of like you were moving on. Yeah, so I, I scored. I, I never started the season. He didn't play me. I, I scored at Fleetwood. Then I scored at Tamworth. That was on a Saturday. And then we had a game on a bank holiday Monday. And after scoring against Tamworth, so I had two goals in the first three or four games of the season. I, and the, the game on the Monday, I forget who it was against. I was an unused sub. And then obviously I knew Oxford were interested in me from the Football League. I didn't want to go. And I told them I didn't want to go, but I just felt like it, I was, my, my hand was that my hand was pushed a little bit because obviously I scored, and then I'm an unused sub on the Monday, and I'm thinking, hold yeah. on a second, something right here. In hindsight, I should have sat tight and and, and buckled and, and buckled down and, and thought, right, I'm going to stay here longer than the manager because I think he was losing con- control a little bit. Um, and obviously, new manager coming, in. and I think even if he'd have stayed, I'd, I'd have got myself back in the team because I was, I'd, I had a, re- I was in a real good groove there. But I just, I got a little bit impatient. I was young. Let's move on and open another door then behind the advent calendar. What number between one and twenty-four are you going for? Let's go ten. When you first joined Luton, obviously we were on the minus points deduction. I can't remember how many exactly when you joined. Um, but did it affect you, you know, dropping down to a team that was destined for the conference? Did that play on your mind when making that choice? Suppose you consider it, but I, I was a young lad. At, I was a young lad at Middlesbrough. I'd scored however many goals in, in the reserve team and I had a few sniffs of the first team, made a couple of appearances, but I was I was I was never I was never gonna get in and establish myself in the first team. I needed to leave on loan. I went on loan obviously to Luton, scored goals, got went back. And I was still unused, so I didn't even get on in the cup games. So it was a case of there was a few teams interested, and I could have went on. I could have went to um, some teams in League One or what have you. But I just I really enjoyed it at Luton, and, and it just felt right. And I, 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 obviously, I knew we were going to go down, but I was just always of the, of the impression that I will I'll play well, and, and we'll come we'll come straight back up. And if we don't come straight back up, I'll I'll get a move somewhere else because because I was confident in my ability. Um, but I was convinced that if we'd have went down, we'd have come back up. And as I say, yeah, I, I think I would have been proved right in that second season if we'd have kept the team together, um, or I'd have, or I'd have stayed, and I could have added another twenty-four goals to the to the team, even if we never kept the team together. I'm sure we'd have got promoted because the the league was weaker the next season. And I believe we got in that second season. Did we got beat in the playoffs by um, Wimbledon? York was FC Wimbledon. Yeah, Wimbledon. Yeah, yeah, FC Wimbledon. Yeah, so. I do believe we'd have come up, so that was always in my mind. Obviously, I just ended up going back to the football league, but with a different club. So, so it, it, I just wanted to play football and, and to go from playing reserves, even if it was a big club like Middlesbrough, to go and play at Luton, nine thousand, Johnson's Paint Trophy area final, ten thousand people on the pitch, Wembley, and all that. It was just it was a no-brainer because I absolutely loved it. It just it, I, I'd, ne- I'd never been to Luton before. I'd always been up north, and I just. I just really liked the place and and everything about it. My my girlfriend, who's my wife now, she came down. She got a job. We just loved it. Just we just loved it. And then you had spells at Oxford and Portsmouth. Um, you, you did have a good goal record with Oxford and Luton. And it's just that the injuries kind of hit when you joined Portsmouth, right? Yeah. So at the back end of my Oxford, I was at Oxford for three years. In the middle year, um, I was injured for the full season. <clears throat> but in the, in the first season, I had a good goal record. What, Roughly one and two. The start of the second season up until Christmas, I think I was top scorer in the league. Um, I had a really good goal record. And then I got injured at Christmas. I broke my ribs. And then I come back and um, I had a niggle and groin injury. And I didn't score again from Christmas until the end of the season. Um, and it was just, I was just carrying an injury and I couldn't get myself fit. It was basically after the broken ribs, at, I think it was like the start of December. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get myself fit. And then I went to Portsmouth. Um, and it was just one thing after another. And then I got a really, really bad knee injury. And I never recovered. I, I come back, I was not the same player. And after I left part of it, it was just a case of I was looking looking for an exit from football, really. I needed to, to, to get a couple of contracts in the league to get me through my 
uh, my, my, I was doing a sports science degree, get me through that and see me into the transition from being a, fo a footballer to an ex-footballer in, in a new career, really. But we were just unlucky with injuries. Never, ever got injured in a game. It was just always oh, my fault, partly my fault, overtraining, mm -hmm. trying to trying to do too much in the gym. And just, I think the way my body was made up, it was just, uh, I was a little bit injury prone with, with my knees. How do you deal with that as a football player? Because there's a lot of things about mental health nowadays. And you look at Billy Key from Accrington, who, who, you know, he's just decided just to give it up. Is that like really tough mentally to when you have an injury like that? Yeah, it is tough. I mean, I, I basically I signed for Portsmouth um, and I was really, really um, enthusiastic about it. Portsmouth gave me the same sort of feeling I got when I signed for Luton. You know, the fans are, are, are so passionate. It's like it was an old ground. It just everything seemed very similar. And then, yeah, and it's just like a bit of an anticlimax, really. I got injured more or less straight away and it was just, I was in the gym for two years. So you just, I think you can go two ways. You can sort of crumble or you can go, right, I'm going to get back fit. And I convinced myself I was going to get back fit. Looking looking back on it, I had no chance because of the injury it was. But um, yeah, it is tough. It, mentally, it is tough. But I think that I always had one eye on, on what I would like to do when I finish playing because obviously you read stories about ex-players going bankrupt and, and having a lot of mental health issues. And I had a couple of friends who had mental health issues as well. And so this is you're talking like, five, six years ago. So I, I was aware of it. I think because I was aware of it, I was able to deal with it better. And I think that's what's happened now with all the, with, with the amount of mental health issues that get documented. I think because people are more aware of it, there's better strategies to combat it. But it, as I say, mentally it didn't affect me, but it is difficult. And I can see how a lot of professional footballers get sucked into that and, and, and really struggle with it because you've been wanting to do something since you were two, two or three years old. And then click of your fingers, it's done, it's finished, you've got to go and find something else. You're like, hang on a second, nothing's going to replace yeah. this. Nothing's going to replace. I, I play at Kenilworth Road and I score a goal in the 90th minute. I've got people singing my name and all that. What's going to replace that? Um, let's move on. Another number then for the advent calendar. Which one are you going to go for? Uh, let's go three. the run to the Johnson's Payton Trophy final, that Brighton semi-final. Uh, as a Luton fan myself, when I look back at the run, I think the early rounds, no one really cares. And it's not until it gets to the semi-finals, and it's actually, we can get to Wembley here. And that second leg um, was just a special night, weren't it? You got you got the first goal. Um, I think they got a red card and it, it just such a special night. Yeah, just when you mentioned it there, I just got a little a little chill on the back of my neck there because I remember it. My, my wife was in the crowd and... Um, Obviously, I knew how much of a big club Luton was, and I knew how fanatical it was. But I, it was just before I signed that. I signed just before that game. I signed permanently just before that game. I don't think I'd, I'd I don't think I'd had it many evening games at Kenilworth Road. The evening games on loan had been away from home, mm -hmm. and then while I was on loan, we had the Bournemouth game, but that got called off because of snow. So it wasn't like a proper night game. So this was the first proper night game, and. So yeah, there's nine or ten thousand there. Obviously, a Tuesday night night game, and uh, the atmosphere was like. I remember coming out for the warm up. It was like, wow, this is a bit different. Oh. And and then obviously we we started the game. I scored early on, which I think helped the atmosphere. And it was just one of those again that you'll never forget. Absolutely brilliant. It was a special night, and I think there was a great photo of when uh, when the um, when we scored the last penalty. All the fans ran on the pitch. And all our players were running towards the goalkeeper and I was running back the other way for some reason. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was just a special night. It was brilliant. And obviously it was leading up to the to the Wembley final. So it was it was great. When you have that penalty in the penalty shootout, as a young player, are you nervous to take that? Or are you just full of confidence knowing, yeah, I know I'm just going to smash us down the middle? No, no. I used to practice pens all the time. Um, and I took loads of pens previously for Middlesbrough. I'd scored, scored most of them. I'd missed a few. So I like... I've really worked hard on, on, on pens and so I think when you work that hard and you practice that much, I wasn't nervous at all. I was like, I know where I'm putting it, I'm going straight down the middle and and uh, I was just, I know you don't know you're going to score, but I was not, I was pretty confident I, I was going to score. Let's move on to another number then for the advent calendar. Uh, number one. As a player in a season like that, is having that distraction of Wembley just unreal? Yeah, I think le leading up to the game, it was just something to look forward to. It was it was a breather from the league. 
you know, and the situation we had in the league. And, and because we had such a good dressing room and such good lads, it was like everyone was just so excited for it. And yeah, it was just, it was just brilliant. It was really just fantastic. One of the best days of my life. And, just Pat, and my dad always said one of the best days of his life. And a lot of our family were there. It was, it was really good. I think a lot of fans would say the same as well, really, because you, you look at that day, 40,000 Luton fans there. You know, as a as a player and someone like yourself who's from up north and, you know, is, I didn't know Luton had that many fans. So to, I think to see 40,000 Luton fans there must have been for the players just a massive boost. Oh, it's, listen, it's something you will, you never ever forget. And it's like one of my, barring my, uh, my, my three boys being born, it's uh, my most proudest moment playing, playing for Luton uh, on that day and, and obviously winning. And obviously scoring as well. Um, it's e- even now, you know. I joined Facebook last year, and I have loads of people messaging me. That was a fantastic day, one of the best days of our lives. And and I've got friends who live in London, and, and wherever you go, there's Luton fans all over the place, old, young. And some of my friends who live in London said, "Oh, we I work with someone who supports Luton." They say. Wembley was one of the best days of their lives and all that and you think and you look back and you think you don't really realise at the time obviously I was young and when you're a footballer you're focused on I know I remember we played the game I was already thinking oh we're playing Lincoln next week I want to score against Lincoln I want to get my goals up for the rest and you never sit back and actually think about it but un- until you finish and um, yeah to make people that proud of obviously the football club and to be a part of it I was just like especially a football club like Luton as well it was such a rich history it's um, yeah, it's fantastic, and I'm just so proud of it that we were able to do it without That's... sounding too uh, cliche or, or, yeah. or soppy. But generally, generally how I feel, yeah. It was a great day. You got on the score sheet, but that first goal as well, you play a massive role in that because you look you look back at that now on on YouTube and stuff, and it's a great ball. Your touch and pass for that is unreal, and then for Chris Martin to finish that, you know, it is that in the Premier League that gets that's spoken about quite a lot as a, as a great goal yeah I think uh, it was a good bit of movement from myself I span on the shoulder um, off the defender Rossi, Rossi I always knew whenever Rossi had the ball he was able to deliver them passes him and Nico had a, a great passing range um, and yeah I was obviously I, I pulled on the shoulder I was able to, to, to take it down on my chest and then seeing Chrissy running through and obviously yeah it was just, just a nice little deft chip half volley pass um, not easy, not easy, but obviously Chris made it look better because he, he finished it um, and, and he's gone on to obviously have a great career. So it was good. So, as, I, as I say, scoring, winning and assisting at Wembley it wasn't a bad day really. So so I'm very proud of. Uh, let's move into the final advent calendar door and uh, maybe you know what's behind this one, but let's, uh, let's have a number. Uh, let's go seven. Behind door number seven is the slap because I feel like you can't not talk to Tom Craddock and not talk about the slap. Uh, do, you, do you look back at this and just go, "What on earth was I doing?" Yep, yeah. I remember. You know, I, rem- I remember when after I did it and the refs talked to the linesman. All I'm thinking was, "Well, I don't want to swear, but I'm thinking." Shh. <laughs> I I was planning my apology to Mick. I wasn't thinking about the rest of the team. I was thinking, what am I going to say to Nick, to Big Mick and Nico? Because I was like, they they are going to like, especially Nick, I was like, they are going to go through me. I was thinking, oh no. Um, but what went through my head, I don't know. I think just the occasion, the guys ran across me. Um, yeah, and I've just... Have you ever done anything like that before? Like, is that, just, is that like the first time on a football pitch you've ever just done it and then just instantly just gone in your head like, what on earth have I just done? <laughs> No, I remember there's a few times it, w- when I was at Middlesbrough, I had, I, like I was never, you, you, obviously you see me play, I was never a player that went smashing into tackles or anything, but I had a bit of a, a hot-headed streak, for want of a better, a better term. There was a few times when I was coming through at Middlesbrough, I did stupid things through, just through losing my temper or, or, or you know, a, a daft moment. So it had happened before. Um, and there was a couple of times after, when I was at Oxford, it, it, it happened as well. And um, it's just... It's some, I don't know, just a weakness in, in my mentality. Now and again, it used to just come out. Did you tell the boys at half time what happened? Did they know? I can't remember. I, I, I probably will have done, but I can't remember. I can't remember if I did or I didn't, or it really got spoken about. I think Mick asked me what I did, and I told him I slapped him. And he, you know, a big mix, I think, just probably started. Just like, 
had, had in one of them smiles or said something, said something really dry and funny, probably. Um, but I can't remember. I can't really remember half the time. So, I, I, as I say, I probably will have done. But I've seen uh, Cliff since he coached at Sunderland for a bit, and I coach at Middlesbrough now, so I've seen him. And I just said, "All right, mate." We not didn't really speak about it or anything. And, and funnily enough, as a sister, my friends know no Luton fans. Some of my friends also know Scunthorpe fans, and they've like said, "Oh, Tom," because I scored against them when that um, scored against them when I was at. Uh, Portsmouth as well my only goal for Portsmouth so I've had a bit of stick off Scunthorpe fans <laughs> for that especially obviously scoring the goal for that so, yeah, just a, a moment of, a moment of madness really just thankful that uh, it's remembered in a in a jestful way rather than being sent off and costing us the final because that would have been a massive massive regret it is iconic um, now because you look back at that day and it's like 40,000 Luton fans 3-2 from coming from behind your slap it's just like it's, it's like you say it's just part of the day now and I think that's what when people look back they remember it for them reasons yeah, yeah, and as I say, people always. I've had loads of people saying about the day, but I've also had loads of people saying about the they call it the Craddock slap. Yeah. So, <laughs> one of them, you just got to you just got to laugh and just. As I say, I'm just thank God that I didn't get sent off, and then and the ref and the linesman, and the fourth official didn't see it. Obviously, there'd be no chance now if there was VAR. Oh no, what I did. They are. You'd be walking yeah. straight for it. No, no, no need to wait for that red card to come out. You'd be straight <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, Tom. Thank well, you so much for joining us. Um, no problem Merry Christmas have a good one and um, catch up soon thanks mate much appreciated see you later how good was Tom Craddock guys oh fantastic it was, it was he's such a down to earth sound of a guy so good isn't he kind of guy. more importantly your safe looked pretty good in that oh thank you <laughs> weirdly <laughs> enough I, uh, I, uh, I've I, never I, seen him looking that good yeah, <laughs> him. I'll put that's the uh, ring light on that's the effect it has mate uh, but I Tom what, what what a guy to chat to and I actually had such a good time chatting to him for what 20 odd minutes there about his time at Luton I didn't ask him about his Wembley goal it's the one thing I just watched that back I didn't ask him about his goal he was questioning that a second ago yeah. I was mean, thinking that yeah, yeah. He was great though, Tom Craddock, when he played for Luke Money. Loved him. I loved him. I was really disappointed when he left. And, and now we know why he left. You know, uh, I, I was just gutted when he went. But uh, do you know what? When you think about some of the goals he scored, and that, that Wembley one, for instance, was just amazing on the day, wasn't it? When you, when you think about how he, he, he struck that from, what was he, just edge of the box? Edge of the box, box yeah. yeah. Edge of the box. Nice little half volley. Brilliant goal. 2 1 up there at that point, weren't we? Yeah. 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 Amazing, yeah. You know, um, how well he speaks of our club. How well he speaks yeah, of our club is fantastic. And also just like with Tom Craddock and that like five games that, that what I, what I spoke about and how he wasn't getting played by Richard Money and Luton fans, I do remember them going like, why is Tom Craddock not playing? Because I remember seeing the same thing. And then he went to Oxford and it was like, we're stuck now, Matthew Pantoma. Yeah. It was interesting to see uh, or hear what he said about Richard Money as well because, you know, Money wasn't really liked by, by are, the fans. Are you surprised though, Dave, really? No, not really, it, no. I'll be honest, like, whilst we were hearing that, I'll be honest, I, I, I'm not really surprised what he said. I mean, I'm pretty sure Rich Money knows his stuff. I mean, he's a wise guy, isn't he? But everyone knew he had a bit, had a bit of a wankery Well, he had that, him, so, that yeah. fallout of the fans, didn't he, yeah. Money? Yeah. And then when we played Cambridge, what, in League Two, I think there was a bit of a bust up on the sideline yeah. or something. Yeah, he's a stubborn old Mate. bastard, isn't he? Yeah, everyone yeah. knew he was a stubborn fucker. But, but do you know yeah. what? Do you know what? What a Christmas present. Uh, Tom Craddock comes on and he's bloody brilliant. Thanks for coming really on. Really good. It. Loved it. Sorry, man. Well, let's move into Leon Barnett, who was on Zoom with me earlier on in the week and spoke about his all-time 11 of players he's played with and against. Let's get into this. Three, two, one. Here we go! I'm going to put someone that I played with, uh, played with him at Wigan. It was a bit of a... It was a bit of a tough uh, choice. I probably I didn't know whether to choose Ali Al Habzi, who, who was an international uh, O man and won the FA Cup with, with Wigan. But I'm going to have to go with Scott Carson, just purely because I don't know. I just think he was more consistent, more the round goalkeeper in terms of he'd be very good on his feet. He was a good um, shot stopper, good vocally, and I, I don't know. I just I, I think he just has that extra edge over Ali Al Habzi. Let's start with the fullbacks. So. A lot of people probably won't agree with this one, but I um, at left back I had Paul Robinson um, at West Brom, and he was he was phenomenal. So um, I probably have to say with him. So we're putting him at left back. Uh, yes, you are. Yeah. So who's at right back then? Probably Russell Martin. When he was at Norwich, he was he was very good. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether to have a little throw up between him and Kevin Foley. I think 
Kevin Foley. You know, I'm going to go with Kevin Foley purely because he was uh, more of a utility man. I remember playing with Kevin in the youth team and he was more of a centre midfield and uh, he slotted into that, that right back role at Luton and uh, at Wolves. So probably have to give him the edge purely because technically he was unbelievable, Kevin. Uh, a lot of people don't realise how good he actually was. Um, he was you know, captain Wolves in the uh, in the Premier League and he's obviously manager uh, in Tampa Bay. So um, he played at a high international level and yeah, he got everything he deserved in football. He's done really well. Kevin Foley was probably one of my favourite Luton defenders growing up, actually. So I'm quite glad you've put him in there. I, I, I always thought growing up, I wasn't a young, but I always thought, no, he's a solid right back, Kevin Foley. Yeah, I think, I think just for the, the dream team, I think I have to sort of mix a bit of play like playing with them playing against them and obviously people that were in my youth team that I know from sort of I know what they're like so yeah I think Kevin was I don't know I just think he was unbelievable like technically he was very gifted and you put him in centre midfield he can do a, a job in centre midfield remember he even playing sort of right midfield for Luton so just shows he's got a, he's got a bit of class wherever you put him in the pitch and is he one of the boys you're still in contact with now do you still have words for him yeah we've, yeah, we've got a little group chat that um, a lot of the boys that were in our youth team, so even kind of um, Curtis Davis, um, he's still there, he, he's at Derby, um, he's done really well, um, obviously Kevin, and just a few other players that obviously didn't quite make it, but you know, we've always stayed in contact just to see what you know, each other's doing. So that moves us on to the centre-half positions, does Curtis Davis get one of them or, or are we going we gonna to skip past Curtis? Uh, yeah, I'll probably have to put him in, I'm going to squeeze him in there. Um, like I said, when he was in the youth team, he uh, it was a bit weird because obviously when he was in the youth team and I played with him, I thought he was I thought he was really good. Like he was, he was very vocal. He was a good leader and he had that physical stature about him. And I don't know the time that he came in was a bit funny because I remember the manager. I'm not too sure who the manager was at the time, but they were very close to releasing him. And I remember there was a couple of injuries at some half in the first team. And you know, Curtis. I remember Curtis coming in just thinking, oh, I just want to leave and maybe go and trial somewhere else. And a lot of the lads were just saying, listen, just carry on, mate. Like, you never know what could happen. And then um, he ended up training with the first team and got his chance and he's never looked back. He's, you know, I think he's been in the England under-21s. He's actually had an England call-up. I think he just missed out on the actual main squad. And, you know, he's playing, I think he's like 35, 36. Obviously, unfortunately, I think over the weekend, he just um, ruptured his, his right Achilles. But I don't know, he, he's another one that's mentally strong and a good leader that obviously has taken Lewin a lot further than what he for and a lot further than what Luton for but yeah his career has just escalated and because you know him so well and, and he is at that stage of his career now where an injury like you just said he's, I think he put on his social media is out for the season is that saying that you're yeah. confident enough that he can bounce back from and go again next season yeah I think a lot of people probably people will probably think you know have question marks over his age but I just think that he, you know, he's got to 35 and in general I think the modern day football is probably playing a lot longer than they, they were kind of like 10, 15 years ago. So next to Curtis Davis, who are we going for? Uh, I'm going to go for someone that I played with at West Brom. I think he was sort of a massive leader and that's what I like in, in a player. And it's uh, Martin o- uh, Jonas Olsen, sorry, the, the Swedish international. And you know, I played a lot of games with him and I feel like I learned a lot. He was a he was a leader uh, from as soon as he came in, he was sort of six foot six and he was the same sort of height as Peter Crouch and you never really thought that he could sort of I don't know be quick off the mark or put in good tackles but I think he surprised a lot of people because we, we I think West Brom bought him for like a minimal fee and when he first established himself in the Premier League he was well and truly above, above a lot of the players that we thought he would be uh, I have to I have no obviously no doubt of it and I'm sure, I'm sure that a lot of people probably agree with me but I remember when I was at Norwich and we played against uh, Liverpool and it had to be Steven Gerrard, he was phenomenal. Right? And even when we played him uh, when I was at Luton and that, I think that famous kind of FA Cup uh, game where we were winning 3-1 and they turned it around at half-time and yeah, him and Javi Alonso just ran the show and obviously Javi Alonso scored from the halfway line. But yeah, Steven Gerrard is obviously one of the best England midfielders ever. So um, yeah, he's definitely got a place in my team. There's so good. many questions that you can ask about Steven Gerrard, but if, since you mentioned that Liverpool night, what was it like playing in that game? Because I just remember, as a fan, it, you didn't even really mind in the end that the, the result was 5-3 because it was just such a thrilling game. It had everything. It was on TV in front of millions. You, you reflect on that that game now. What, what are your thoughts? Just, are you like, still disappointed that the result wasn't our way? Uh, not really. So when, when I was... Because obviously I was on the bench to start off with, but I just thought I'm delighted to be on the bench and obviously watching these stars and just be this close to sort of those sort of players. And, I don't know what happened. I forget there was an injury and I had to come on and 
up and now I was just kind of not starstruck but I was just like amazed at sort of I'm on the same playing pitches as you know Steven Gerrard and John Arnarisa and, and Pepe Reina. So Steven Gerrard takes one of the midfield spots let's talk about the other two who, who are we going for? I don't know really who to go for there's quite a few so you might have to bear with me I remember at West Brom there was a guy called uh, Zoltan Gera and I think he's probably one of one that should be in my own team um, I think it's probably a little bit of a surprise from obviously Steven Gerrard to Zoltan Gera but I just remember him just being I don't know like a massive influence in our team getting promoted um, to the Premier League So who partners Zoltan and Steven in the midfield? I'm going to have to squeeze uh, Wayne Rooney in midfield I know obviously <laughs> He didn't have his best years as a as a midfielder, but I think just having his calibre. I remember we we played him um, when I was at, at Norwich and at, at Wigan. We uh, we played him in the Community Shield, and he I thought he was phenomenal in terms of he was a, the sort of bulldog everybody remembers him as. He was a bit of a menace on the pitch, but he at, at such a young age, you kind of like run the game. He'd be you know telling people like Rio Ferdinand to you should be there, you should be passing the ball here and. It just, it just shows what respect where everybody else gives to him. Uh, okay, so um, so I'm going to put the centre, the centre forward. Um, it's going to be Kevin Phillips. Um, once again, I had him at um, West Brom, and you know, he, I think he was the, the, the top goal scorer in the Premier League. He set records. He's got the golden boot as well. So I just think when I went there, I just I knew obviously his scoring record, but I just kind of underestimated him because. I don't know, he must have been about five foot nine, five foot ten. And you think, how has this fella got so many goals? And mm -hmm. I remember going into training and trying to sort of like bully my way into him, but he was phenomenal. He was because he's got that low sense of gravity, he was, he was strong, he was quite quick off the mark, and he just knew where the goal was. So, have we got two strikers up front with him, or are we going for some wingers? I might have to have a little bit of a lopsided striker and a winger. Let's go for it. It will have to be sort of Harry Kane. He um, he came to us on loan um, when I was at Norwich, um, and I think he was. He must have been about seventeen or eighteen, but obviously nobody sort of knew who he was when he came in. He was sort of very quiet coming into the change room, and I don't know, just wanted to get his head down, not really speak to nobody. And then, so when we got on the pitch, we knew obviously he had some sort of some talent. And that final spot then in that attacking role. So once again, when I was at West Brom. Um, I was started on the bench and we was at Old Trafford and uh, Ronaldo was playing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't fit in Suarez, like I said before, but, you know, Ronaldo, I think everything speaks for itself. Like his stats and his time at Man United, obviously he's gone down as one of the best players Man United have ever sort of bought. And as a defender, when you know you're playing a game and you're coming up against this calibre of attacking player, do you thrive off like the pressure of having to deal with these guys? Is it like a like a really exciting challenge or do you like turn up going, yeah, this is going to be a tough one today? If I'm honest, like I said, I, I'm obviously, I, I grew up in Luton and I kind of dream about playing against players like that. So. If I ever come up against them, I'd be obviously in, in awe of them and just like I'd be, I'd be loving it. But obviously, once I once I go past that white line, it's you know they're another player. They're not sort of any idol of mine. So I, like I said, I try to make the game difficult for them if I'm not having a, having the best of games. And that was always what I tried to do. Just obviously cause a bit of a heartache for the uh, strikers. But yeah, he's one that probably uh, got the better of me. But like I said, I, I, it was just a privilege just to, to share the same sort of pitch with him. Amazing stuff, Leon. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, hope you have a very good Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Another great old Luton player, Leon Barnett. Thanks so much for joining us. It was so good, weren't he? Absolutely, love yeah. I love it. I what love an 11 it. as well. That 11 would do pretty good on the pitch, wouldn't it? I'd take Renown up top any yeah. day of the week. Would you? And Harry Kane Class. nowadays. <laughs> Harry Kane. Oh, Harry Kane played for Norwich. Nowadays. No, nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I remember Norwich mate in the cup. He came on against yeah. us or whatever he did. He was shite. But yeah, we'll forget that. I'm not going to sit there and ask you to name your all-time Luton 11. I oh, don't. Cause, no, because he used to give us But would Pelly Ruddock make it? <laughs> You're asking me because I think he's asking you, Bataro. Yeah. Absolutely asking Merry Christmas. Get oh, in there. Yeah, of course he would. Yeah. Pelly Ruddock would make my all-time yeah. Luton 11. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, oh, definitely. That's your age, From my man. lifetime, he would. I I think all three of the players I've had on the podcast. Who, oh, who would be no. Over actually? Nichols. No, to be no. fair, no. <laughs> can I ask a question then? All time favorite midfield for Luton. Kevin Nichols is in there straight away. Kevin yeah. Nichols would be in there. Love Pelly, Keith no, King. Ricky, Ricky Hill. Even I wasn't around. He's not in my lifetime. Then, but I know Ricky, Hill. but not in my lifetime. Put Keith Keane in there. 
Probably not. No. no? <laughs> All right. No, <laughs> sorry. No, I've been around in my lifetime. Would you? Has, has to whine. Is no, well, not as a midfielder, I don't think, no. Matty Spring. No. Matty Spring. Matty Spring. He was all right. He was good playing until he uh, done the old dirty, but yeah. What about Precy? Yeah, sorry, David, I don't remember him. Yeah. You're, you're suggesting names from way past. Yeah, but you see, there's we the thing. No, then you, should do, you boys should do a little bit more research on No, no, no I've heard of these we players. Who they are. Yeah, it's just oh, not, it's not, a, it's not part me. of it, is it? David Priest. Oh, he's, he's a, offended. Excuse David. Me. No, hang on. He's David. A, I know, he's like, I've seen he's a, a lot of videos and whatever else. He's a bloody legend. If you want to talk about legends, David Priest is one of those. He's got a stand line now for him as well. Don't forget that. He's a good guy. He does, to be fair. He's a good guy. Yeah, Go on then, Dave. Who's your all-time best midfielder? I've just told you. <laughs> Priest. You've not been listening. Ricky Hill. Re- da- well, which one? Priest or Ricky, Ricky Hill? <laughs> Ricky <laughs> Hill. I'm, I'm going for... Who's if that? Ricky's listening, it's Ricky Hill. <laughs> <laughs> if he isn't? No, he, Ricky Hill was my all-time favourite Luton player when I was growing up. Yeah. As he was for a lot of people. Uh, David Priest was a great player. Paul Carden. Paul Carden, <laughs> my God. <laughs> Avel Bester. Well, my favourite all-time midfielder has got to be George Moncair. He joined us on the podcast. I'll see what you've done there. Earlier on today. And I think he told me about his all-time favourite player. Uh, I've got to say, obviously, my dad, because he played for West Ham. Um, Obviously, I was at West Ham myself, but um, I used to obviously watch a load of videos on him and stuff. Um, because I was quite young back then but yeah I'd have to say my dad just because one he's my dad and two he's played in the Premier League Did you learn a lot of uh, you know a lot of your skills and stuff from your dad? Uh, I'd say so like he told me about sort of my first touch sort of technical ability and stuff Um, so I used to try and obviously he used to give me quite a lot of tips how to help and stuff like that and I've took that over the years so I really think it's quite helped especially technical side of the game and is there anyone else that you just looked up, up to, like when you were, you know, growing up and, and watching Premier League football? Is there anyone else that really just stood out to you? I don't really have anyone else. You know, obviously, the only geezer now, really, that I really like to watch is Grealish. Um, and that's the sort of guy that I'd try and be like on the pitch because he just wants to get on the ball and play. I think the obvious one, obviously, is eat a load, um, <laughs> but not too much. Do you get involved um, with the Christmas cooking then? Is, is that is that like your thing on Christmas Day? To be fair, I cook most of the meals every night, mate. Um, so, uh, obviously this year's a bit different with the family rule and stuff. I don't really know what I'm doing, especially with, um, obviously, my wife giving birth again as soon. So I'm not sure what's going to happen this year, but I'll probably end up doing it myself again. And is there anything special on George Monker's Christmas menu or is it just like a pretty basic Christmas dinner? I don't, to be fair, mate, it's just everything you normally have, I'd say. Um, obviously, just the only difference with me, I'll always smile, even if it's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, Brussels sprouts, do you go for them? Nah. No? Nah. They're, they're strained a bit. Yeah, not for me, mate, to be fair. Um, I've got a few, to be fair, but I think, obviously, the obvious one is getting pro- Promoted with Luton um, from League One to the Championship. Um, obviously, it's my first promotion, so it has to be that, I'd say. That was a very special season, wasn't it? And it was just one of them ones that uh, you joined in in the winter, in the winter window. But I think from Luton getting promoted to, from League Two to start so well, and then just from January kick on after Nathan yeah. left in, in the first instance as well, to kick on and do so well. Just such a great achievement from everyone. Yeah, it's brilliant with everyone involved from obviously the boys that some boys are still here that were even there before me. So you've got a great squad and it's a great achievement for everyone involved with the club. I've got a few, but I'd say Portsmouth. I was hoping you'd say Portsmouth. Yeah, just for the pure moment of the game and everything that stood like. Um, obviously, quite a big significance to that goal. So I'd have to say that one. That goal really was just something special, wasn't it? it and it yeah, was a crazy game right. because I think a lot of Luton fans have said that first half against Portsmouth was the best football they think they've seen Luton Town ever play. And yeah, it was mental. It yeah. was mad. And in, in the snow as well. It, you know, you turn up to a game like that when it is snowy. Does that play on your mind as a player or are you, are you just happy to you know kick on with it? 
yeah, I'd say like obviously it comes into it a bit. I think it's only natural to think of like the weather and stuff, especially if it's cold. But uh, like I say, if you start the game well, I think like they like we did that night, and then anything's possible. And we really showed them how good we was. And in the build up to that free kick, it was you that was fouled, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yes. if I remember right. Yeah. And was it always the intention then that you were just going to be on that free kick? Because obviously James Justin's there with you as well. Is this like a planned routine? Yeah. Are you like, I, I know exactly what I'm doing. I sort of always try and, I sort of make my mind up as soon as I see what position it's in. But um, yeah, I just said to him, run over it, try and make a little dummy and stuff and I'll do the rest. And luckily I did. And the rest is history because that just goes down as one of the greatest nights at Kenworth Road. That noise, it's yeah. five points clear at the top. Mate, what a night, what a goal to score as well. I'm glad that's yeah, your <laughs> Great, mate. Can't get much better than that. That's tough, that, to be fair. Um, well, I can, I'll can. i say, obviously, the birth of my son, because it's around Christmas, that's going to be my best one. Oh, Don't amazing. think anything's beating that. You got, obviously, you... I'm a little, I've got a little girl and I, but she weren't born in Christmas, so I can't really say that. <laughs> can't be um, picking favourites yeah. already. <laughs> yeah. Have you, you got a name in mind at all? Yeah, um, Albert, I think, for the boy. And when are you expected? This week, I think. Um, so, yeah, it should be any time now, really. I don't know, mate. That's an odd one, that. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you and the boys at, at Luton do Secret Santa at all? Is that a thing? I don't know. To be fair, I haven't done it last year. We didn't do it last year, so I'm not sure. Um I don't really think I've done that anywhere, to be honest. Are you much of a shopper at Christmas? Do you do you go out of your way to find people gifts, or are you just more just sit back and do the cooking? Yeah, to be fair, mate, I can't stand it when you go to a shop and it's packed. Um, <laughs> there's nothing worse. So what I normally do is just go on the old internet and see what I could get, really, without having to leave the ass. <laughs> I love that because that's kind of like a similar attitude to me, really. It's like, I can't be bothered to leave. Just yeah. straight on Amazon, straight on straight on Google, find yeah. something. It's nice and easy. That's it, mate. That's it, mate. That's the best you can do. Obviously, playing point of view would have to be Luton, definitely, because the atmosphere is unreal. Um, but if I was to play at one, uh, probably be somewhere like... Uh, I've been at Old Trafford, actually. Probably Old Trafford, I think. I think it's probably the best I've seen. And it's just how... It's just like crazy how you can say like the best atmosphere at Luton and you know say like Old Trafford is one you is just yeah it's just weird isn't it that Luton can have only hold 10,000 but it, when it's rocking in that place it's it's proper loud it feels like, yeah it feels like 100,000 in there it's mental I've got loads mate I'll get on with <laughs> everyone um, I'm just gonna have to say Elliot obviously Elliot's my mate it's been my mate for years and I Obviously, me and him have played together. We know I know he's going backwards, and like he knows mine. So, um, obviously, training sessions and that, we always try and pass to each other little one twos and that. And yeah, I think he's a great player. So, when you joined Luton, was it is it like easy coming into an environment when you know there's someone there like Elliot Lee who you're clearly quite close with? Yeah, I, I like I said, I knew a few there. To be fair, I think I knew three or four. So it was lovely coming into a place where you know people straight away and you ain't got to have that awkward sort of silence when you don't know anyone. I'd say like obviously the favourite thing about playing in general is just getting like the love for the game in terms of playing football. Um, Luton definitely makes an impact especially with the fans. I mean the fans are great with me like I've been at other clubs where you can if you have sort of an off game or whatever you can get slated where I'd say Luton have always been positive behind you, even though you might not be having the best time. But, um, yeah, it's just a gift, I think. And obviously, you know about my faith and everything. And I just thank thank Jesus every day for being able to play play football. And you've had a pretty good start to the season, haven't you, really? You got that goal against Norwich, the goal against Huddersfield. You hit the post at Swansea. Uh, it seems to be at yeah. the moment, your trademark thing is that cut inside. No one seems to be able to deal with it. Nah, it's just... I think like a lot of the time where it's like you need a sort of run of games to really show what you can do and I think that's what's happening at the minute where I'm getting used a lot more than I did last year. Um, so like football fitness and football fitness in training is so different to playing it on a Saturday and I think that made a big impact where 
if I'm playing a lot of games regular or getting involved, you'll see the best out of me because it's the fitness that sort of is so much different than just training every day. Um, so I think that's really helped a lot as well. And with this schedule with, with COVID-19, it's, it's been mad, hasn't it? It's been Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. And is that as a yeah. player, does that, does that take its toll fitness-wise? Yeah, definitely. It would definitely be hard, especially if you like, let's say, you played last night and you've got to play in two, ga- two days, really. On um, Wednesday, especially if you have a game on a Wednesday, it's a lot of football um, for anyone. So um, your body can't really fully recover until probably the Sunday or Monday. Um, so it's a lot to ask, but like I say, you can't moan because every other team in the league's doing it as well. Per- it's actually perfect timing as well. My favourite thing to do if I would do it now, I love darts. Me and Jordan Clark, I batter him every single day in the dart ball. <laughs> so I get home and watch the World Championships, which is on at the minute, and it's on in the afternoon and at night, so it's perfect for me. Have you been to the darts at Ali Pali? I've been once, yeah, and it's, it's unreal. It's unreal. It's I've never cool. been. I've never been. But it's, it's definitely on my to-do list. As soon as COVID's gone, it's like I'm, I'm yeah. there because that sounds like a cracking oh, night. It's fire. It's actually the best. It's like my ideal place. Being like, being acting stupid, being an idiot with people dressed up just as bad as you are. So it's great. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll see a little dart celebration the next time you score. I, yeah, challenge, I've got I one challenge one. you yeah, to that. I'll yeah, I'll do it next time. How good was George Munker? Again, I've said that after everyone, but what a guy. What a guy. 180. <laughs> He's such a geezer, isn't he? He loved it. Loved it. <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> I fucking loved it. <laughs> Either way, he was really good, weren't he? Look, even Hudson's joined us on the podcast right now. But George Munker, next time he scores a goal, going to do the dart celebration, hopefully, for us. And, you know, it's... I love the way that he talked times. about. I love the way he talked about the goal at Portsmouth because it meant a lot to him. It was a great night. It was a Portsmouth. Brilliant, night. brilliant. I wasn't there, but night. Night. I love how passionate you got with that goal as well, Luke. It was the way you were talking about. It was just it's because a, it was just a big night. Good, wasn't it? Wasn't it? It, was it was a brilliant night. It was, it was a such a good night. And something you'll never uh, again as a Luton supporter, especially the young guys, you'll never forget it. You'll never forget that was, it. That was class. And Steve kind of joined me in that seat. I did, didn't I? Two seats to the left. Steve and Steve's dad. Big shout out, Trev. Big Trev. Thank you. <laughs> but Monka, when, when he scores a goal, he scores great goals. They're always good goals, They're aren't they? Always with good goals, yeah. Always good goals. Long range free kicks. He's got everything he. And always. the other the other thing I liked what he said about um, when he was talking about the grounds and saying that Old Trafford was you know a big ground, but when you're at Luton with ten thousand people and the, the atmosphere sounds like a hundred thousand. And that just shows you what support does for the team. So get behind the lads all of the time yeah. because it, it does help. Tom Craddock said a few things like that as well, didn't he? He said that he just loved the atmosphere, especially on the Brighton game. Mm-hmm. He um, mentioned that it was just a, it's just different. Kenilworth Road is different, mate. It's just Kenilworth Road. I love it. Do you know what? When it. we leave that place, it's going to be a really, really sad time. Really sad, yeah. especially for people who've been there for mega years. But even when when we get to a new place, can we create the same at- atmosphere? Who knows? But Kenilworth Road on a, 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 a Tuesday or Wednesday evening, floodlights on is an amazing place to be, you know, amazing. The atmosphere is second to none. I love it. I defy so anyone to say it's it's not the best atmosphere in the country. Well, guys, what a great podcast we've had today. Uh, thanks so much for sitting here and, and enjoying that with some cheese and some wine and mm. people going to enjoy Christmas Day tomorrow. It's going to be a good one. I've Excited? Been, What's I've Santa bringing you? Of whiskey since if Santa course. doesn't bring me a Is Santa bringing you some whiskey? Uh, I is he? he does. Yeah, do you know what? If Santa doesn't bring me a new Luton shirt, I'm gutted. <laughs> so I missed what I missed. Out, I missed out on one for my birthday. Uh, I'm not naming any names, but you know. And, and uh, if he doesn't bring me a Luton shirt, I'm going to be really disappointed. You fucked up, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, what's Santa bringing you? Oh, I don't know this year. We'll see, what, see what's under the tree on Christmas. Amazing. Day. Well, Merry Christmas to you uh, watching this today. If you could drop us a like rating on YouTube today, that would be very much appreciated. And you know what? Go share this with a friend. If you know, you're sitting there and you know someone that would love to watch this and, you know, catch up and listen to what George Moncur says and Craddock says and Leon Barnett says, uh, recommend it to them. Get us on socials, Oh When The Town. We'll be back next week to discuss everything about the Boxing Day fixture Reading away. Um, yeah. Until then, Merry Christmas. Have a Merry good one. Merry Christmas. Christmas. It's Christmas! Oh, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Have a great day. Too much, too much and we'll see you next week. <laughs>